Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com. One of you asked me to come up with a list of the most underrated symphonies. Well, that's kind of easy, actually, because I've done underrated composers and underrated this and that. And we've talked about them all over time. Um, but I'm always happy to do a list of underrated everything. And I, I don't mean underrated. I, I call these ridiculously underplayed because the fact that they're underrated means they don't get performed. I mean, the idea is is when you have the opportunities to hear them. Some of these pieces are rated very, very highly. It's just that you don't hear them. So I, I'm not sure that underrated is exactly the word. That, that, that depends on who you're talking to. You know what I mean? But underplayed is a little bit more fact-based. These are works that should still be or ought to be or aren't but are deserve to return to the regular repertoire because they are major, major works by their composers and they're absolutely fabulous and we never get to hear them in concert, at least, at least not frequently enough. It doesn't mean they don't get played once in a while. Some of these I've actually seen maybe like once, but you know, they deserve to be part of the regular repertoire of performance because they're that good. So here, without further ado, are 10 works that fit this description. 10 ridiculously underplayed symphonies. And it, you're going to see on this list things that I've talked about a lot. Um, I really have. But then the whole point about them being ridiculously underplayed or underrated or whatever you want to call it, under something, underwater, you know, under garment, under, under something, is, is the fact that they don't get talked about enough. If we don't talk about them, they're not going to get played or listened to by you, my, my delightful audience. So, uh, you know, you got to keep pushing. And so I'm going to keep pushing. These are some of my faves. I could do a list of 100 of these, but here are 10. 10 of the major ones. Number one, Haydn, symphony number 102. Well, when you write 107 plus symphonies, obviously some are going to fall by the wayside. But number 102 is widely regarded as one of Haydn's greatest orchestral masterpieces, along with his last symphony, the London Symphony, number 104. But 102 has no nickname. Nobody knows anything about it, and it doesn't get played. It's fabulous. It's unbelievable. It's as great as anything he wrote and greater than a lot. I mean, it's incredible. It has typical, wonderful Haydn London Symphony innovations, such as the slow movement with muted trumpets and, and, and solo cello. And I, I mean, it's just extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. It's also Haydn's most Beethoven-ish symphony. And I'm talking about Beethoven when he became Beethoven, not Beethoven from the first two symphonies. I'm talking about later Beethoven, basically. It's an amazing work. Absolutely amazing work. And nobody gives it time of day. Um, that's for damn sure. I actually got my orchestra to play it once, and that was the only time I have ever heard it performed. Hmm. Not that Haydn symphonies get, get much play anyway these days. It's ridiculous. Okay, next, Mendelssohn, Symphony Number no. 1, his formal first symphony, as he originally wrote it, not with the scherzo of the octet substituted in. It's a delightful work. It's obviously based on Mozart, um, who was Mendelssohn's model, but that doesn't make it any less wonderful. And the thing people need to keep in mind about Mendelssohn's first symphony is that it wasn't his first symphony. It was like his 14th because he wrote all of those string symphonies before um, as he taught himself how to write symphonies. And then when he got to the last of them, the big, I mean, he was writing big, fully-fledged four-movement symphonies, one of which he orchestrated in, for full orchestra. So number eight, I think, exists in two versions. I mean, the guy knew what he was doing by then, really knew what he was doing. And his first symphony is, is it's in C minor, it's Sturm und Drangisch, it's passionate, it's fun. And the very ending where all of a sudden it switches to the major key and like all hell breaks loose is just, is just splendid. It's absolutely terrific. Mendelssohn himself conducted it like in London where it was very popular with the substitute scherzo, but it, it gets no play. None at all. And I don't get it because it's as good as anything Mendelssohn wrote. It's a splendid piece of music. And if it has some obvious antecedents, good. That's all the better. We'll recognize and enjoy them, won't we? 
So yeah, Mendelssohn's first symphony definitely deserves an extra, an extra dose of attention. Um, he didn't write so many that we can afford to lose one. Well, I mean, regular orchestral symphonies. He did write quite a few before, as I mentioned. Then we've got Scambati, Symphony Number no. 1. Now, this is one of the composers who's not a household name. Um, and he's not a household name because Italian composers aren't supposed to wrote, write instrumental music or orchestral music, abstract orchestral music. And he did. And he didn't write a lot. I mean, there, there's very little, but I've been talking about him in a couple of recent videos. His first symphony is a, a flat out masterpiece. It has an original form in five movements. It has some fabulous surprises in the writing for like piccolo and harp and whatnot orchestrally. And it's, it's just beautiful. It's full of fabulous ideas, wonderfully treated, and it deserves to be an absolute repertory piece. I mean, there's no question about it. So the Scambati is something you really ought to experience if you haven't yet, if you didn't see my video on Scambati, because I've noticed that, you know, people go by titles of these videos. And if you look like, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, of course, if it looks like it's going to interest you, you listen to it. And if it doesn't, you don't. Fair enough. But, you know, maybe this title will encourage some people to watch who would not otherwise watch a Scambati video. You know what I mean? And here's your chance. If you missed it that way, do it this way. Next, a piece I've always, always been flogging, Goldmark, his Rustic Wedding Symphony. It used to be a repertory item. It is one of the most beautiful, tuneful, gorgeously scored tone poems slash symphony things of the entire latter half of the 19th century. And it fell out of favor at one point. It has seen its, its uh, you know, it, it's had its day on disc largely by conductors like Leonard Bernstein and Maurice Provenel and whatnot who were around back in the day when it was still popular. And apparently they woke up and looked around and said, gee, nobody's giving this thing any love anymore. Let's do it. So they did it. And then there are a couple other ones since then. But basically it gets, it gets no attention and even less respect, goodness gracious, because it's a programmatic work. But it deserved its popularity. It is wholly beautiful from beginning to end. And I think it would be a huge hit um, in concert. It's just it's that kind of a piece. It's, you might even say it's a pops piece. It's so pretty and so nice to listen to. So yeah, deserves a comeback. It's totally underrated and under, under, underplayed for sure. And then Piston, good old Walter Piston, Symphony Number no. 4. Now, I had some interesting experiences with Piston because in my little community orchestra, a lot of guys um, or people and women who were in the orchestra had gone to conservatoire and they were raised on Piston's books on the orchestration and counterpoint and whatnot. He was regarded as a dried out old academic, um, you know, who was completely and totally uninteresting. And, 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 you know, they would never listen to his music, of course. And when they did listen to it, they hated it because they had had fugues and things in it and whatnot. Piston was one of the great American neoclassicists. Um, and that's what he was. I mean, that, that he wrote almost entirely in abstract orchestral and, and instrumental forms, um, except for except for the New England sketches and maybe the ballet, the incredible flutist. I mean, but basically um, what he wrote were, were symphonies and concertos and things like that. They tend to be very brief and very uh, concise. That's the word, I think. Concise in expression and compact you know, 25 minutes, you know, it's a, a long piston symphony, let's put it that way. And his sixth was somewhat well known because it was premiered by Charles Munch in the Boston Symphony. Michael Tilson Thomas recorded the second because anyone who went to the New England Conservatory had to know their piston or if they worked in New England. And, I, it, but they don't get played. I, my orchestra did the sixth and the second. We did them both. They were, they were beautiful works, lovely works. They're not easy to play. It's one of the reasons they don't get as much attention. I've seen the second performed, aside from my own performances, once um, at an all piston concert. And uh, no one ever does the fourth, ever. I think it's had one recording. Well, there may be another one out there somewhere. There may have been an earlier one on like in mono with like Howard Hansen or someone. But, but essentially, the only stereo modern one was Jerry Schwartz and the, and the Seattle Symphony. Um, very fine performance of a, just a beautiful work. 
really fun to listen to and full of you know, lovely ideas and 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 catchy orchestration and zippy rhythms and it's just a good piece a good solid piece of symphonic writing in a recognizably american style and it's only like 20 some odd minutes long you can't go wrong with it it's it's absolutely beautiful after piston well here's one that i've really been flogging roussel symphony number no. two is it the greatest french symphony of the 20th century possibly you know you only you only see it in the context of Roussel symphony cycles, aside from the one singleton performance, um, which was Jean Martinon's on Irado, which is like still the best one. But people just pay no attention to this symphony at all. And it is a masterpiece. Probably it's because it ends quietly. It, it's written with a kind of austerity that French music of the time was, you know, not doing particularly. I mean, it's a serious, Frankian three movement cyclical form kind of symphony with a motto theme that comes back in all the movements and it's it's really a powerful and expressive masterpiece absolutely i mean i can hum all the tunes it's not that it's not tuneful but it's long and it's concentrated and it you know technically it's in a major key but it, it's very emotionally ambivalent um i i just think it's fabulous my goodness, and it's it's Roussel's greatest symphony. It's a big sucker. Well, for him, like forty minutes long, um, and after that, he too became a major sort of neoclassicist and started paring things down. But wow, what a piece! And uh, it deserves to be played every fifteen minutes, and it doesn't get any attention, like I said, because it ends quietly and because it's it's a tough piece, and people don't know Roussel all that well. Um, so it's out there. It's out there in, in limbo, and it deserves to come home from limbo. And after Roussel, Carl Nielsen, Symphony Number no. 5. See, when a composer that everybody acknowledges is a great composer, but doesn't really want to spend that much time with, and the great composer gives titles to most of his symphonies, and there's a really popular one with a really popular title, that is Number no. 4, The Inextinguishable, uh, people don't pay attention to the next one, which is probably his greatest symphony. Number five, with no title, in two movements, in a strange, unique form, all its own, with a crazy snare drum cadenza in the first movement where the, the guy is directed to play as if to stop the progress of the orchestra at all costs. I mean, it's, it's a thrilling, I mean, viscerally thrilling dramatic work. I've seen it pl played, pardon me, I've seen it played exactly once, um, Osmo Venska came to New York and did it with the New York Philharmonic a few years ago, maybe I guess a decade ago by now or more. Um, it was marvelous. And the audience loved it because it's such a joyful, life-enhancing work. I mean, you have this huge, dr titanic drama in the first movement with the snare drum thing. And in the second movement is the reconstruction and the rebirth of vitality and elan. And, 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 and oh my God, it's powerful and exciting. And it's all over in like half an hour, it's 32 minutes or something. It's, it's, it, just, it just flies by, but it doesn't get played. It's a very difficult work. It's very difficult, particularly for the strings. I mean, Nielsen was a string player, and he, of course, like most string players, he hated the string section. You know, who became string players, who became great composer composers. He wrote for the winds because he knew that great orchestration depended on woodwind writing, and the strings do a lot of busy work. And and then Nielsen, it's a lot of really fast passage work and like rapid triplets and you know sawing back and forth. It's all over the place. So it may be that it's it takes a bit of rehearsal, and audiences don't warm to it, or orchestras don't warm to it the way they should i mean like they do in denmark but god damn it's fabulous and it deserves to be played constantly because it's one of the 20th century's greatest symphonies hands down i mean it's like most people agree with that but that doesn't mean you're going to get it played 
if it's going to be heard or respected the way it should be. And after Nielsen, Martineau, of course. Martineau wrote six symphonies. The only one that people pay attention to most of the time is number six, the Fantasy Symphonique, the last one, which of course is a screaming masterpiece and is very, very beautiful and marvelous. I've actually seen it played a couple of times, but number four, ah, number four, I, I played all the Martineau symphonies. We did it in our, our orchestra, or at least most of them. And number four was the first one we did. And it is such a beautiful work. It's in many ways, Martin News, I, I think most characteristic, it's sort of his biggest symphony in terms of, I mean, the first is longer, but the fourth is kind of the most expansive in scope and the widest in emotional range in some ways. I mean, I've had the opportunity to see most of the Martin News symphonies performed. Well, no, not most of them, at least let's see, six, four, and and five well four five six and and now just four five six that's it i'm in concert dutois did number five um a couple other people did number six but four is just beautiful and uh, it has a fabulously exciting finale especially at the end where the marlboro man seems to come riding through <laughs> it sounds like a western um and it sort of it sort of gallops to the finish line but uh yeah they were all written in the U.S. They were all written for American orchestras, and American orchestras have treated this amazing gift with complete and utter contempt and dismissiveness. Shame on them. For shame, for shame, for shame. Because he was a major, major 20th century composer, and his six symphonies are as good as any 20th century set of symphonies. So, yeah, I mean, they're all good, but four definitely needs um, a regular hearing. Um, and would, I think, really enchant audiences as a result. Then we've got Prokofiev. Now, Prokofiev symphonies are very patchy. Everybody knows that. They're, they're, some of them are a little weaker than others. Um, and the two popular ones are numbers one, the classical symphony, and number five, which was a wartime symphony, but also a wartime symphony, um, was number six. And number six is, is or, immediate post-wartime symphony. So every time I do a date, and especially when I talk about wartime things, everybody throws, you all throw dates at me and says, well, it was two years before, six minutes after. I, mean, I don't care. It was around that time. You know, it was in the air. It was part of the zeitgeist. Prove me wrong. There we go. But no, the sixth is, is arguably Prokofiev's symphonic masterpiece, at least according to the Prokofievians or the Prokofniks or whatever they're called, it's a problematic work because it is, it is tougher than the Fifth Symphony. It's less obviously melodic. It's in three movements. The form is a little unusual. The second movement is huge. It's this big, long andante with strange patches of desolation and crunching dissonances. And the very ending is quite elegi elegiac. Um, and until the until the final chords, which snatch victory from the jaws of defeat, sort of, kind of. I mean, it doesn't have a typical happy ending. It's really quite a remarkable piece. It really is, and it doesn't get played. I saw it performed once in my life, and I'll never forget it because it was one of the worst concerts I've ever seen in my life. It was the Beethoven Halle Orchestra of Bonn back before Germany had was united. <laughs> It had Bonn as the capital, and Dennis Russell Davies conducted, and he is just the worst conductor of that kind of music that you can imagine because he's totally cold and and inexpressive in virtually everything he does. That's why he gets to do all the Philip Glass premieres. I mean, he's very good at what he does, but he they did this. I have never seen a more limp, colorless, lacking in impact. Oh my God, it was just horrible. Horrible. Now, of course, there are marvelous recordings. There's there's Yarvi, of course, on Chandos and Ashkenazi with Cleveland and and other people who've done very fine versions of the sixth. Um, but there are also quite a few bad ones because they usually come in the context of complete symphony cycles. Um, they don't get a lot of separate attention. The Ashkenazi was separate. And I don't understand why it isn't more well, I understand why it's not that popular, but popularity isn't the point. Once things get played regularly, 
I mean, you know, audiences want to be taught. They want to be told what to listen to. They want to, you know, they, they will make up their own minds too, but you have to have some sort of, some sort of, 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 of you know, you have to stand behind these pieces. You have to promote them. And if you say to people, look, this is Prokofiev's masterpiece. It's not as easy as peace. Listen to it with an open mind and open ears and listen to the huge range of emotion and the anguish mixed with triumph and the beautiful, bittersweet lyricism. I mean, who's not going to love it? But the problem is that people, you know, everything is just governed by this sort of inertia where the same stuff gets played over and over again because people are too lazy to learn anything new or they don't want to speak to audiences. They don't want to communicate. They don't want to make the case. It's really, you know, what it comes down to, it's sort of the ultimate hypocrisy because the idea is that, you know, classical music is the world's ultimate masterpieces and they're all so expressive and marvelous that they require no explanation whatsoever. And audiences should, should just come like witless lemmings and sit there with their like, ugh, you know, drooling from one side of their mouth and listen to it and worship at the shrine of, of fabulous culture. But by the same token, people don't feel, because of that, they don't feel they have to make any effort. You know, they feel the performers particularly don't have to make any effort to sell the product. I mean, some do. I mean, there are always forward-looking instrumentalists who have wonderful rapport with their audiences, especially in smaller, smaller venues, chamber music, soloists. People come up with wonderful creative ways to prevent to present music. They do. So I'm not saying it never happens, but in the the big palaces of culture. You know, the palace of culture with the major orchestra, the great conductors, you know, they, they feel that, that we should just worship them because they exist. And because of that, they're lazy. They've just become lazy. They're not interested in really, in really justifying their existence by giving audiences a, a full appreciation of what they're listening to. And if that means giving a little chat or writing a program note or doing something to help them along a little bit, well, there you go. That's what you need to do. So there's that, there's that rant of mine. And last but not least, and this is my biggest, my biggest ridiculously underplayed symphony, Dvorak's Fifth. Now, Dvorak's Fifth is an important symphony in so many ways. First of all, it was his first great Dvorak symphony, you know, fully mature symphonic work. Um, it is, in some ways, a more sophisticated piece than anything he wrote later. I mean, in, in terms of its formal ingenuity, it's extraordinary. I, I don't even know where to begin. It has a, a basic cyclical form and relationship between various movements and ideas and, and the scherzo and the, the slow movement are mirror images of each other, which are joined together and and I mean, it's 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 just impossible to to detail all of the wonderful, felicitous, um, formal formal aspects, which are at the same time married to Dvorak's typically glorious fun of melody, of just amazingly beautiful tunes. Um, it's it's perfectly proportioned. It, it it's just wonderful in so many ways, and not only that. But it was the proximate model for Brahms' third symphony because Brahms knew it. Brahms knew it at a time when nobody knew Dvorak. Dvorak was submitting these things to win his Austrian artist stipend um, to help support himself. And this was a symphony he just sort of chugged it in. And I, I have a personal theory, which no, I can't, obviously, it's total speculation. But one of the fascinating things about it is that this is the symphony in which Dvorak sort of abandoned his you know, Wagnerian infatuation. Not that he didn't write gorgeous works that were infatuated, the Third Symphony being one of them, but it's a very classical symphony. You know, he's returning to his, you know, to the Beethovenian roots of the classical symphony. And it's very, very obvious in this piece. And, you know, for all of its, its innovations as well. And I just have a feeling you know, Brahms had been sitting on his first symphony for like 20 years. And meanwhile, Dvorak is <laughs> chugging, submitting symphony after symphony after symphony. And the German symphony itself at this point was kind of in the doldrums. I mean, there were a lot of them. People were writing them, but there wasn't anything that was like standing out amazingly. And Brahms was on the jury for the Austrian whatever prize. And he probably saw this manuscript come flying in, took one look at it, and he said, holy crap, 
what's going on? And I mean, they became, as you know, great friends as a result of this. And Brahms was a constant promoter of Dvorak's work. And Dvorak was in awe of Brahms. Um, and, you know, when you, when you consider the relationship between the two, of course, it always is one way. It's always, well, Dvorak was the humble Czech peasant worshiping at the great altar of German music. Brahms, but no. No, the relationship was much more complex than that. And it was much more fruitful than that. There was a lot more shared um, shared musical thought between the two um, than, than is, is often mentioned. And if you compare the formal conception of, of Brahms' Third Symphony, which he took pains to play two movements that were finished, the inner movements to Dvorak, um, when Brahms never did that for anybody. Ever. <laughs> he really didn't. And Dvorak was like, wow, that sounds great. And you just, I just wish I could have been a fly on the wall for that conversation. You know, whether Dvorak said to him, you know, it's a lot like my fifth symphony, or Brahms just, you know, said, gee, you know, that was really inspirational, or they didn't say a word to each other about it because their relationship was still a little formal. I don't know. What I do know is that when you compare the two, it seems to me unmistakable that Dvorak's fifth was the proximate inspiration of Brahms' third, but that's not a reason to listen to Dvorak's fifth. The reason to listen to Dvorak's fifth is because it's every bit as great as Brahms' third, and it's as great as any 19th century symphony out there, and no one ever plays it. Oh my goodness. You know, once in a blue moon, you know, someone takes it out for a run. Of course, I, my orchestra did it because I was in charge of repertoire. We did lots of things like that. But oh goodness, it's lovely. Absolutely lovely. And and brilliant and and doho. Oh, it should be as popular as the New World Symphony or the Eighth. Uh, but Dvorak also is one of those composers who tends to get looked down upon because because he was Czech. That's all. And because he wrote great tunes, and because people think that as a result he was formally somewhat, you know, challenged. Which in, you know, earlier on he was a little bit, but not as much as people say he was, and not in such a way as to render most of his large works somehow un undeserving of attention. It doesn't make any sense to me. So it's a glorious piece of music, and uh, that's my, my however pick for the most ridiculously underplayed, underrated, underserved symphony. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me and take care.